Welcome everybody to the first Friday Addiction Toxicology Case Conference. This is our June 4th case conference and we've got some um, esteemed panelists and excellent content. Advance to the first slide. This is brought to you jointly by the American College of Medical Toxicology and the American Society of Addiction Medicine as webinar partners. I uh, just want to refer you to um, previously available presentations and FAQs, which were developed um, by a grant through the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry Opioid Response Network. And you can see the uh, list of FAQs for uh, six of our sessions that were su supported through that, that grant opportunity. Next slide. I'm Tim Wiegand, uh, the Director of Addiction Toxicology and Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. And my co-moderator is Dr. Gloria Beshevitz. She's the Medical Director of Strong Recovery and a Professor of Clinical Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry, also at the University of Rochester. And joining us today, we have Dr. Joanne Lace, uh, ACMT and ASAM expert. She's an attending physician in the Division of Addiction Medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center. Dr. Barry Logan uh, is a returning guest expert. He's an executive director for the Center for Forensic Science and Research and Education and at the Friedrich Reeders Family Renaissance Foundation and Senior Vice President of Forensic Sciences, Chief Scientist, NMS Labs, Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Nelson is a returning expert, professor and chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine, Chief of the Division of Medical Toxicology at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in Newark, New Jersey. And Dr. Ra Rachel Whiteman, Director of Medical Toxicology Education and Assistant Professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown U University, Providence, Rhode Island. Next slide. None of our experts have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. And we'll jump right in with case one. And the focus of today is precipitated withdrawal as well as discussing the changing landscape of uh, novel synthetic opioids and other synthetic drugs that may uh, be involved in some of these ingestions and treatment. So case one is titled, I used to take an eight milligram sub 24 hours after last stopping. Now here I am in the emergency department. This is a 24 year old with panic, tearing, nausea, vomiting, and repeated yawning. He just cannot stop moving around after trying to restart buprenorphine naloxone after two weeks of heavy heroin use. 24-year-old male has a history of IV drug use of heroin. Uh, this is the northeast part of the United States uh, in, in New York, where most of the heroin is fentanyl, uh, sometimes other novel synthetic opioids. He also uses cocaine. He's been using two bundles daily. He's had multiple treatment attempts and contacts over the past few years, usually interrupted by a visit to a local detox. Most of the time, it's due to diversion of the medication, which is buprenorphine typically, uh, that he's used for his opioid use disorder, and he enters the detox to stabilize and get back onto buprenorphine. He has declined several uh, recommendations for referral to an opioid treatment program for methadone evaluation, and he declined subcutaneous buprenorphine monthly injections as well. He describes a two-week period of heavy use complicated by some legal issues and two overdoses, he was reversed by bystander naloxone, which was a four milligram intranasal dose times one. Uh, at that time, there was no EMS call. Uh, he's had enough and decides that he um, wants to uh, do this at home to try and get back on buprenorphine without going into detox. He has some buprenorphine and he tries to wait longer than 24 hours to start because he's had some trouble getting back onto buprenorphine in the detox the last two times. Prior to this one, he waited 48 hours. There was no use of opioids and he used clonidine, some diazepam adjunctively, and a two milligram dose of buprenorphine made him feel the precipitated, as he called them. And uh, then he, they gave him a four milligram dose and he started to feel better. Uh, he describes feeling the onset of withdrawal sooner than in detox. And at that level of symptoms, he thought he could initiate buprenorphine, but 20 minutes after taking the eight milligram, eight slash two milligram dose, he felt his skin crawling, nausea was yawning, and it kept building. In the ED, the patient has a heart rate of 120, his blood pressure of 155 over 82. He's got really dilated pupils. He's got tearing, rhinorrhea, restlessness, and pelorection. His temperature is 37.9, and he's sitting in a triage hallway 
with an emesis base and a small amount of emesis in it, and he's obviously uncomfortable. And he's got stigmata by the drug use in an area on his right upper extremity that appears to be early cellulitis. Next slide. So my questions for the panelists, and we'll start with Dr. Logan, is describe the changing landscape of heroin over the past five to 10 years, and then what has been detected in the heroin, just in general, I know you have a, a reference and some other information further on. And then following that, why would this impact the ability to start buprenorphine or, re, or restart buprenorphine for the patient? And then ultimately to all panelists, how do you treat this gentleman? Describe medication, options, dosing, and timing. So Dr. Logan. Uh, thanks, Tim. So yes, that's, this is very interesting. Heroin has been in steady decline over about the last six or seven years. Um, even with the first few months of the uh, pandemic and uh, the stay-at-home orders, which uh, prompted a, a, an increase in drug mortality. Uh, afterwards, other drugs continued to, to increase, but heroin continued to, to decline. And it's really been displaced by fentanyl. And we had the uh, period of time when there were a host of fentanyl analogs. There were about two dozen of them that uh, achieved any kind of popularity in the United States. They largely disappeared about two years ago and the market re uh, reverted back pretty much to all fentanyl. And that's around the time that we believe most of the fentanyl production shifted from Asia into to Mexico and the, the cartels have really just focused on one product that's at least semi-predictable in terms of its uh, dose and, and its effect. Um, we have uh, also we do also see a lot more uh, agents now cut in with with the fentanyl on the street. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of heroin in there, but we're seeing in some jurisdictions uh, up to 24% of the the fentanyl uh, has tramadol in it. Uh, that's uh, just something that's happened over the last two years or so. And then also in the northeast, we're seeing a lot more xylazine uh, in New Jersey over where uh, where Lewis practices and uh, in other, uh, in Pennsylvania and other states in the Northeast, um, seeing more xylazine in the, in the heroin as well. Um, so it's, yeah, heroin itself continues to decline. Uh, there are very few places where you get uh, just heroin on its own. That's interesting that you mentioned the tramadol. I noticed in one of the practice settings, we have an amino assay that will pick up tramadol and starting about two years ago, it seemed to be a very, very frequent uh, positive with fentanyl, along with usually cocaine and THC and, and some other substances. But um, most of the patients had no idea or simply stated, I didn't use tramadol. I don't know where that's coming from. So it's very interesting that's showing up frequently. Um, we're seeing it Dr. a lot Nell? in Massachusetts too. I'm involved in a drug checking project. So I'm kind of seeing what we're finding at least on remnants of drugs. And we're seeing a lot of tramadol and a lot of synthesis byproducts too. So a lot of 4A and PP, a lot of even phenethyl 4A and PP. And a ton we've of xylosine in Rhode yeah. Island and, and mass too. And we've recently we're starting seen to see some analogs too. Like we've recently seen a lot of fluorofentanyl. Yeah, we think that the fluorofentanyl is uh, the result of a change in precursor for the synthesis. The fluorofentanyl is about the same potency as fentanyl itself. Uh, so there's no kind of market advantage, I guess, to, to somebody who's trying to distribute that in terms of its effect or its, its potency. Um, but yeah, you can see some interesting things when you look at the byproducts in these, in these uh, uh, street materials. And then acetyl fentanyl can be both a byproduct and had a brief uh, period of time where it was uh, marketed as a novel synthetic opioid as well. Am I right? Yeah, it was one of the, the earlier uh, analogs that appeared. It's actually less potent than, than fentanyl. Um, you know, when you hear its name, you might think it's fentanyl with an acetyl group on it. Uh, fentanyl actually has a, a propyl uh, moiety. And so the acetyl fentanyl has one fewer carbons than, than fentanyl, which decreases its, uh, its lipid solubility and, and its potency. But uh, the majority of acetylfentanyl we do see uh, in exhibits now is a byproduct of synthesis at so low percentages. Dr. Nelson, do you want to comment about how this impacts the ability to start buprenorphine or, or restart or just in general, how does this heavy prolonged fentanyl use alter the pharmacokinetics or pharmacology? 
Yeah, thanks. I think everybody that uses fentanyl clinically recognizes it as a short acting drug. Um, and it is because it's rapid in, gets in the brain, very lipophilic, gets out of the brain and it's done, but it's not out of your body. It sits in your body, it circulates in your blood and it stores in, in your fat. So if you were to follow the, the path of that drug over time, you would actually see that it's present in your body for three or four days, right? Because it's sitting in your fat and leaching out. Um, obviously that's after a single dose or a single surgical procedure, but if you use it repetitively daily, if you use it in the ICU as an infusion, for example, and you stop it, sometimes it lingers for a fair number of days. And when you use it all the time, like many of our patients do, um, it could, it could linger and store in the fat for, for days to weeks on end. So what happens is it becomes rather than a short acting drug, like fentanyl, what we see clinically, it becomes what we think of more as methadone, a drug that lasts for a very long time. It produces deep levels of dependence because the receptors are always exposed to it. It's not in and out like heroin is or like fentanyl used to be, but rather it lingers for a very long time. Um, so that means that um, uh, when, when you're trying to start people on buprenorphine, it's not like starting people that use oxycodone or, or heroin on buprenorphine. It's like starting people who use methadone on buprenorphine, right? So it's a, it's a little bit trickier. And, you know, we could talk about why it's trickier uh, if, if we want a little bit later, but the, you know, the, the general prevailing way to use, to, to, to switch somebody from methadone onto buprenorphine involves a long process of, you know, of, of waiting or detoxification from the drug before you start buprenorphine. Whereas we don't really do that when we switch people from heroin or, or oxycodone. Um, so what we have seen in some people is the need for either uh, alternative strategies like microdosing or macrodosing to get people to switch um, or to start on fentanyl, which we didn't use to see with oxycodone or heroin. The Thank best you. sort of model that I've thought about for the pharmacokinetics of illicit frequent chronic fentanyl use is the IV infusion model. So when patients are in the ICU on a chronic infusion for long periods of time, the longer they're on that infusion, the longer the elimination half-life is, just because of that redistribution that Dr. Nelson was talking about. And so nobody's done the studies in patients that are using illicit fentanyl, but I think that's kind of just to piggyback off what he was saying, why it's sticking around so long. And we've seen a couple of very limited studies of people who go into substance use treatment who are chronic fentanyl users and the fentanyl and the norfentanyl really sticks around in their urine for prolonged periods of time. In one study, there was still norfentanyl in the urine of someone 26 days after last use. And that was in an inpatient environment where they were controlling everything going in and out. So there wasn't a chance of reuse. Yeah, and just point, see if that's even longer than methadone, right? So, so it, it is definitely, a, 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 it's a complicated drug from a pharmacokinetic perspective and from, by analogy, from a clinical perspective. Right, that study I think you mentioned, Dr. Whiteman, was from Dr. Strain's lab, uh, Eric Strain, and by um, Dr. Hoon was first author and should prolonged um, altered pharmacokinetics of prolonged elimination and heavy fentanyl users. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. Um, Dr. Beshevitz, do we have any comments from the Q&A um, from the audience that you wanna bring up? Yes, there's an interesting question here about why uh, drug dealers would um, put xylazine in opiate supplies for sale on the street. Yeah, in, at, least in, at least in Philadelphia, the, the uh, fentanyl with xylazine in it is sold as trank dope, and that's uh, sought out by uh, some uh, segment of the street drug using population. Um, anecdotally, it produces more of a kind of dreamlike, um, uh, more uh, 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 depressant uh, uh, kind of effect. In, in terms of what, why it was selected for that, uh, xylazine is not controlled in the US, so uh, it's probably easier to source and to uh, distribute in bulk. Um, I imagine that the DEA is, is looking at uh, uh, sources of production and distribution of, of uh, xylazine, but it's, it's still trending upwards. It was first, this, uh, this started in Puerto Rico as anesthesia de caballo, I think used as a veterinary anesthetic, um, has alpha-2 agonistic properties, similar to clonidine or in the ICU dexmedetomidine. So 
it will potentiate the opioid, make them stronger. Also, people that are using this will, will be more physically dependent and then have much more dramatic withdrawal symptoms. And it's also, I believe, in Puerto Rico, at least, been found in cocaine samples, sometimes called un regalito, a little gift. And um, But now in the last few years, colleagues in Philadelphia and in other parts of the Northeast have reported finding it. Um, and even isolated dialysine users um, had a couple of cases on postmortems where, where it's been picked up in uh, analysis. Um, Dr. Lace, do you have any other comments on xylazine or any of the other um, comments we brought up? Uh, no additional comments on xylazine, um, but I think that getting into um, the fentanyl and the complicated pharmacokinetics, some of it, I, I wonder if there's also pharmacogenomic or other contributors to the metabolism of it, because there's there's some people that are regular fentanyl users and they don't seem to experience the same phenomenon, whereas in uh, other cases, they do experience it. So there seems to be some, some other differences in the patients. Yeah, maybe it may be part the you know the adulterants that are in there as well that might play a role. It it, it is really complicated. I I agree with you. Somebody somebody asked a question about um, since bup has a higher affinity than fentanyl, which it does. I mean, bup's affinity for the opioid receptor is higher than every higher than naloxone, higher than everything. Um, it is liable to precipitate precipitate withdrawal even more than twenty four hours after stopping. I mean, I think that the the complicating issue here comes down to a combination of both binding to the receptor and efficacy at the receptor, right? And so it's a combination of those two things. So, you know, potency is a funny term because it has, it has to do with how much of a drug it takes to cause a certain effect. And so fentanyl is more potent than heroin, but you can give enough heroin to have the same effect as fentanyl, right? But when you're dealing with buprenorphine because of its receptor affinity effects, it gets into the brain and theoretically knocks off whatever opioid is in there, whether it's a potent or a not very potent opioid, right? But you can still affect, you can still cause more effect on that receptor, even if a drug has a high affinity for the receptor by giving more of the drug, right? And this is, this is Tim, I don't wanna jump ahead if we wanna talk about micro and macro dosing, but this is really where you're taking advantage of either of those little pharmacokinetic tricks of trying to either essentially overdose or, or intentionally underdose a patient using buprenorphine to, to, to take advantage of either the affinity or the potency of the various different drugs. And you kind of mix and match things to have, a to have the benefit that you want. Oh, that's great. I think moving into the treatment of this gentleman is, um, you know, important. We've got a couple of other cases where we can just describe that further. So, um, and we've got a couple of other comments, basically reflecting on you know some of the things that we brought up um, brought up during the panel discussion. Um, so let's let's talk about treatment of this gentleman. He's in the ED and he's miserable. He's had precipitated withdrawal, and um, we don't didn't calculate a clinical withdrawal scale, but it's pretty high. What are what are the options here? Um, Dr. Whiteman. So, I mean, I could tell you what my first line agent would be, um, but I think just going through all the options would be symptomatic treatment. So thinking about giving things like Zofran, Clonidine, um, Benzos, controlling the symptoms, but none of that's going to get to the underlying psychological symptoms patients experience, the dysphoria, the craving that they're experiencing with an opioid. So what I would do for this patient is I would give them a big dose of bup. I'd probably give 16 milligrams up to 24 milligrams, one-time dose right there while monitoring them in the emergency department. Because I think it's gonna be hard to treat them without getting an opioid on board to treat the dysphoria and treat the craving. And because of that low KI and the tight binding affinity, it's gonna be hard to get a full agonist opioid on board. So I think BUP is your safest and best approach here. Can you, you comment a little bit on, unless you're at the bedside or even when you're at the bedside, how easy is it for you to convince a patient to take buprenorphine again after they've had precipitated withdrawal um, or providers through the phone? 
Uh, I've had this conversation a bunch of times, so I, I hope I've gotten better at it over time to kind of talk through what's going on at the receptor. But it's 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 pretty much explaining to a patient that a little bit of bup is probably knocking their opioid off, so knocking off the fentanyl that they were using, so they're in withdrawal, but you, they didn't get enough in order to get enough opioid effects from the partial agonist, so they need a bigger dose is where I would yeah, go. And I tell them that they're going to feel a lot better. And if they don't, they're in the emergency department and we're here managing them. And it's, it's probably the safest place to do this. Yeah. Well, I had sometimes patients look at me like I've got a third arm coming out of my forehead when I mentioned it, but I say the buprenorphine has knocked it off the receptor. Another dose isn't going to make it worse. It's going to bring it up out of, bring it up, reactivate it. So, um, you know, I, and I say, I have no interest in making you feel worse. Let's, do this together, give them some clonidine and, and, um, you know, it more and more frequently people have realized, I think that works. Uh, Dr. Bashevitz, um, I know there's been some comments and chat regarding this. Anything you want to add? For Dr. Nelson. Um, you know, I, I think that the comments in the chat have really been about fentanyl's lipophilicity, but that's exactly, again, if you just think about, about the difference between heroin and methadone, it's really, it's really what's going on here. So we've used, we've used high dose buprenorphine in the way that Dr. Whiteman just described to take people who are on, you know, hundred milligrams or 120 milligrams of methadone and in one shot, essentially convert them over to buprenorphine. I know it's anathema the way most people think. Right, because most people, as I said earlier, you have to kind of quote unquote detox off of methadone and drop them by 10% a day or something over a long period of time and then start them on buprenorphine. But if you give enough buprenorphine, you can find that combination of, of dose to maximize the affinity on the receptor and knock off the buprenorphine, knock off the fentanyl or the other opioid or the methadone and give them enough buprenorphine to actually treat them. The, the trick is, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I know people down in Philadelphia, for example, you know, you talk, Dr. Perone will tell you that she gives this, she does this to her patients down there. And maybe Barry, you've heard this from, from them, where they all go into withdrawal, you know, and in my population, I do the same thing. It sounds like what, what Dr. Whiteman's talking about, they get better, right? I, I take people and, they, and it doesn't happen. So, and, and maybe that's what Dr. Lace was talking about, that there's some pharmacogenomic or maybe some different adulterants, who knows what it is but our patients don't all behave the same. Now and again, I give people a, a macro dose, 16 to 24 milligrams and they withdraw. I give them more and usually it stops, but other people tell you they give it and the patients just withdraw, withdraw, withdraw and they never catch up. So I can't exactly explain why that happens. But my experience like, like Dr. Whiteman's has been very, very positive giving people high dose buprenorphine at the get-go. So it's routine that I give 16. It's pretty common, I give 24. I've definitely gone to 32. And in almost all cases, people have gotten better. Yeah. And I know I think, that there were some questions in the chat about what you would do outpatient. And I can say I, I treat patients over the phone via telehealth, via our Rhode Island buprenorphine hotline. And I, I would treat them pretty much the same way. I would tell them to take the 16 milligram dose um, based on the knowledge of just kind of how buprenorphine works with the ceiling effect on CNS depression, respiratory depression. I, I think it would be safe outpatient to, to go for that. And we, and we cover outpatient a couple of protocols later um, in one of the cases, so we will get to that. Um, I, you know, there are some different uh, protocols, and there's also, as Dr. Nelson brought up, different types of precipitated withdrawal. There's mild, where you still have a lot of full agonists sitting there. There is more severe. This gentleman seems to be much more severe. He took an 8 milligram dose that if he took it appropriately, it's going to knock most of the fentanyl off the receptors at 24 hours. And if he were only mild, you know, usually my, my preference is to use very small doses repeatedly, pretty frequently, um, either one milligram or even sub milligram. And if they tolerate two doses in a row, titrate up. If, if there's an, a severe precipitated withdrawal, I'll jump on the higher dose. And in general, patients seem to tolerate that, but there is some variability. Um, let's move along. Um, we've got a couple of other cases. And again, we cover some of this. Go back one slide, I think. So this is um, Dr. Logan, you can comment on um, some of the opioid trends from um, one of your reports.
Thank you. This Dr. is Lee. just a re this is just a resource that's online on uh, the website of our organization. Um, if you Google NPSDiscovery.org, uh, we publish trend reports for major drug categories. This happens to be for NPS opioids. Uh, just to the question that uh, we had on the, the last slide about what's in the mix. Um, definitely fentanyl is the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, the next most common uh, novel fent uh, or opioid agonist that we're seeing currently is a drug called metanidazine. It's a member of a class of benzamidazole uh, mu opioid agonists that are pretty potent, some of them uh, many times more potent than fentanyl itself, but very low uh, prevalence, uh, one to 2% relative to the number of uh, fentanyl cases that we see. So there still is a, a subculture of, of novel opioid experimentation, um, some pretty potent. Um, we're seeing in a couple of parts of the country upticks in uh, carfentanyl positivity. Uh, but at much lower doses than we saw during the big peaks of carfentanyl uh, three or four years ago. So that's something to keep in mind uh, when you're interpreting uh, talks from the lab. Thank you. And the uh, attendees last month, we did talk about non-fentanyl novel synthetic opioids, including clusters of isoconitazine overdose from 2018 into the 2020s. They really were clusters. Dr. Logan, um, have you seen isotonitazine? Um, it's in the same class as metotonitazine, I believe. Yes, yes. So the uh, isotonitazine, uh, metanitazine, uh, etanitazine, uh, these were actually developed in the 1950s by SIBA uh, uh, as potential analgesic agents, but were never uh, developed for or approved for, for use. They've been rediscovered by illicit manufacturers just in the last couple of years. So isotonitazine had its peak um, middle of last year, middle of 2020, that was replaced for a while by a drug in a related uh, class called Brorphine. Uh, and then Brorphine had a relatively short lifespan of about six to nine months before it started to decline and was replaced by, by metanitazine. Um, metanitazine is about uh, equipotent, a little less potent than, uh, than fentanyl, uh, but again, currently not scheduled in the United States. Just one word, if I can, Tim, about, and, 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 you know, Dr. Logan's right. I mean, the potency things are very important, but remember potency is all relative, right? Because most of these potencies are done in either in vitro or animal models and things, and you can always overcome potency with dose, right? So early on in the, in the, you know, back when we had a lot of these analogs, um, part of the reason there was little clusters of overdoses was because people didn't exactly know how to dose these very potent, um, analogs, right? There's nothing, there's nothing more quote unquote toxic about carfentanil than about than fentanyl, other than the fact that it's a hundred times the potency. So if you give a hundred times less, it's no different than giving fentanyl, but obviously people don't know how to dose it. Right. When they first, when it first comes into existence. And even if we knew that in an animal model is a hundred times, that doesn't mean in a human, it's going to be a hundred, but I mean, the, the numbers you're quoting are totally reasonable, but we don't really know this from controlled clinical trials. Like we would, like we would do for most drugs that we, that we, you know, use or, or approve through say the FDA. So it is a little tricky. Yeah, that that's very true. And, and frequently the, the animal models, the mouse models significantly overestimate the, the potency. Good, thank you. Let's move on. There are some comments about ketamine for severe precipitated withdrawal. We can, I think, discuss that in the second case, um, which is a little bit different case. So th this patient is given a two milligram dose followed by an eight milligram dose or eight slash two. He actually was offered an eight slash two, but refused um, despite the reassurance that now you have precipitated withdrawal, we can bring you out of it with more buprenorphine. And one of the detox episodes where you've taken a two, um, about 48 hours in, um, and, and not stayed at the, at the center and gotten a forward felt better. He did, demanded to go to the ED where he was given an eight slash two milligram dose. He says, at first I was worse, but then I eventually start, started to feel better. Um, he said that the uh, eight slash two initially caused some vomiting and increased restlessness. He was given some clonidine, a milligram of lorazepam on Dancitron, but one to two hours in, he did start to feel better after a second eight slash two milligram dose. And then he was given a third eight, eight milligram dose and he really had good effects with those 
kind of three doses, one to two hours apart. And he had a similar pattern of use prior to this detox episode, two bundles of daily um, heroin with some Prestel Praslam um, at the time as well. Uh, the detox is using diazepam. So next slide. Uh, this episode, he's given 0.2 clonidine. Blood cultures are obtained. He started on antibiotics for cellulitis to the right upper extremity. After one hour, he notes some improvements, and he agrees to then try the 8 milligram dose, after which he notes symptoms improving further. He's got no further nausea or vomiting. He's able to drink some water and juice. His GI symptoms actually started to improve after the first 2 milligram dose. And later that evening, he's given a 30 slash 2 milligram dose and then spent 48 hours in the hospital recovering and continued on. 16 milligrams a day of buprenorphine. He's getting fluids, treatment for the cellulitis. His chemistry had showed some acute kidney injury that improved over the uh, course of his stay. It's a mild rhabdomyolysis. The CK was in the 1000s. And his urine screen was positive for fentanyl, cocaine, amphetamines, and he denied amphetamine use. Benzodiazepines, and again, he denied use. Uh, opiates and THC. Next slide. Uh, so the patients continued on the 8-2 BID, some clonidine adjunctively, and ultimately after hospital stay linked to an area program where he is now going to consider the subcutaneous buprenorphine as an option. And he comments that the drug screens are a mess. He hasn't used benzodiazepine since the last detox, uh, which was three to four weeks ago in diazepam, and he doesn't use meth or amphetamines, just cocaine. And he also comments, one of the clinics I was at told me I was using fentanyl, and this is pre-COVID when there was more on-site um, and more testing, and um, he was getting some counseling and medications for opioid use disorder. He, he, he said that when they sent it out for the confirmatory screen, they showed I wasn't, but the preliminary screen showed that there was fentanyl there. He said he was pretty upset. Uh, so my question is, can you help the patient understand the results of the drug tests he's described and the ones that have returned in the ED, which is positive fentanyl, opiates, cocaine, amphetamines, THC, and benzos? And any false positives for fentanyl on initial testing? Sure, I can Maybe. I can tackle the fentanyl false positive question first because we've been seeing this uh, a lot. Um, frequent ones that I see in practice are labetalol, risperidone, trazodone, especially in elderly patients that come in with falls to the hospital and then they get a urine drug screen and the family gets really really upset when it comes positive for fentanyl. Um, then we figure out they're on trazodone. Other potential false positives that we've seen, I'm trying to think, those are the three most common ones for sure in my practice. I don't know if other people have comments. I had one with sertraline that repeatedly had positive, confirmed negative, and then re taken off, disappeared, restarted, recurred. So sertraline in, in actually two patients. Um, Dr. Logan, do you have any thoughts on false positives with the fentanyl assay, the immunoassay? Um, nothing to add to what's already been said. Um, in our casework, fentanyl positivity is so high um, that the, the false positive rate is very low. Recently, an article just came out. It was in the harm reduction literature of using the fentanyl test strips, mm -hmm. and they were actually seeing false positives with diphenhydramine and methamphetamine. Um, in really high concentrations in press pills when they were then diluting them and testing with the fentanyl test strips. But in that context, a false positive, I guess, would be much better than a negative. Yeah, it can cause a lot of confusion in my experience, in particular, counselors aren't aware, and you really are just including the drug testing. It's just really a component. It certainly is not an end-all, be-all and you know the patients and providers need to be aware of that. There was a comment about why are you using buprenorphine naloxone? I never induce on anything but buprenorphine. Um, I typically just use the dual product and found that that is safe and effective and not a not a problem in doing the inductions. The naloxone is minimal absorption um, and doesn't really um, precipitate withdrawal. Patients do fine on the dual product. I don't know what any other experiences. Dr. Nelson, do you? Use anything different? Well, in, in the hospital, we use this single product just because it's a little less expensive. But when I, and so when I give people the drug, I usually give them just bup. Um, but when I prescribe it, I always give the, um, the combination product. I mean, there, there is some controversy out there about how much naloxone is absorbed and how much an effect it has. And, 
especially when we get to these high dose of buprenorphine, maybe we are absorbing consequential amounts of naloxone. I got to tell you my experience, I really haven't seen that, but you'll talk to people who tell you it's just a horrible you know, experience for people due to the naloxone. So I don't really know what to make of it, but, but certainly uh, the um, bioavailability in, you know, in the sublingual form is pretty limited, but it is not negative. I mean, you definitely absorb some, but again, in my world, it's simple. I don't have a choice of giving the combination product in the emergency department. Yeah. And I can't say oh, doing this repeatedly in the inpatient setting and watching at the bedside that I've noticed any problems with the dual product. Um, despite reports of allergies and intolerance. And, you know, I think some of that is they're interpreting precipitated withdrawal as caused by the naloxone and uh, not that it just simply was buprenorphine started too early in some of it. Um, but let's, let's move on. Um, just one quick one question, and if I could just ask, is it possible that this false, so, so when they said the clinic said I'm using fentanyl, but the test was negative, what, why did the clinic say that? Like, where did they get that information? Just if epidemiologically, they knew that the, the quote unquote heroin had fentanyl in it? No, a dipstick, a preliminary amino assay that would have been done with the uh, dip oh, and returned and confirmatory screens. Um, oh, and then I wanted to comment on the benzodiazepine that a lot of patients aren't aware of diazepam will stay around for weeks to even longer in repeated use in particular if an individual has you know a lot of lipids so that could simply be from a detox episode a couple of weeks prior um, and then amphetamines maybe there's a lot of cross um, reactive substances bupropion pseudoephedrine um, sometimes increasingly in our area we're seeing some methamphetamine amphetamine um, positives with people that are reporting only cocaine use so it may just have simply been some adulterated drugs or or something. Um, We've been but, seeing um, yeah. methamphetamine mixed in with the supply of other drugs a bit in Massachusetts. Tim, yeah, here's an interesting comment. question about um, uh, someone is seeing methadone, positive methadone in patients who are not on methadone, but who do use fentanyl and cocaine, wondering if uh, that is diverted methadone or possibly a false positive. I, I've not seen uh, false positive methadones, or um, uh, though of course there's diverted methadone, but um, I, I don't know that it's being mixed into supplies of other drugs at the moment. I've seen, I've seen a lot of false positives with methadone. Things like diphenhydramine can cause a false positive. Verapamil can cause a false positive. So figuring out what other meds that patient's on, because that might just be your answer right there. Initial though, but um, usually the confirmation will, will sort that out. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why it's important to also, um, if you're going to do the immunoassay, be looking at methadone metabolites. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's move on to the next Next slide. All right, this case involves a much more severe uh, precipitated withdrawal. Uh, three doses of four milligrams of intranasal naloxone in rapid succession in a patient down from presumed heroin overdoses and severe withdrawal 20 minutes after he rolls into the ED. I think this is really pertinent in, in particular given that we have you know, the newly available eight milligram doses in naloxone. So we can comment a little bit about that. This young male is found down by a significant other. She hears a crash in the bathroom where he, she was aware he was injecting heroin. And she administers two doses of ion, intranasal naloxone, four milligrams each, um, because he was pale and had this stuff coming from his nose. And she wasn't sure that the naloxone would get in. She does this in fairly quick succession. Calls 911. Uh, her brother is staying with them, who's also using. Uh, he has another dose that um, he gives shortly after um, he sees the patient. He's um, pale and some frothy sputum is coming out of his nose and mouth. And they describe rolling him on his side and keeping him there until medics and fire arrives. And by the time EMS arrives, he's agitated. He's vomiting. He's having whole body tremors. He's got dilated pupils. He's markedly tachycardic. He's really dilated pupils. Uh, he's diaphoretic and he's brought into the ED. Next slide. So other than what EMS reports from the scene, his significant other reports, uh, the response to the 12 milligrams of naloxone, no further information is available other than some prior uh, hospital records that show emergency department visits for intoxication and complications from IV drug use and cellulitis. And then some of the information in the, in the history suggests use of heroin and fentanyl, cocaine, some prior synthetic cannabinoid or K2, THC, intermittent benzodiazepines, uh, 
suppressed alprazolam with heroin and fentanyl, and this one, this had resulted in an overdose three months prior. So what are your treatment strategies for this patient who's coming in with very severe withdrawal, agitated? Would anyone try to rapidly administer a dose of buprenorphine? And if so, what dose? And I bring this up in the context of we are, um, if anyone attended ASAM 2021 and saw Dr. Haros and colleagues lecture on um, medic-administered buprenorphine um, in um, Camden, New Jersey, uh, they presented a, a fairly large series of, of patients, I believe about a 1,000, 100 of which accepted a dose of buprenorphine from medics with um, fairly good results. So what um, would you do with this patient who's fairly sick, uh, Dr. Nelson? I would do exactly what Dr. Haros does, which is give a large dose of, of um, buprenorphine. I mean, I do this to almost everybody. Um, there's, you know, as we mentioned before, the affinity of buprenorphine is, is higher, substantially higher than the affinity of naloxone. So we'll knock the naloxone, so to speak, off of the receptor and we'll quell precipitated withdrawal. Um, you know, what, what, was, what was there before was a patient who had an opioid overdose. So it is possible that you'll still have some buprenorphine precipitated withdrawal left over, right? And that's a problem if you don't give enough buprenorphine. So if you were to try to give four or eight of buprenorphine, you'd probably be able to reverse the naloxone, but you'd wind up with buprenorphine precipitated withdrawal. By going for these higher 16, and that's what Rachel uses down in Camden, 16 and 24 doses, like we've talked about, you can not only reverse the naloxone, but you can essentially convert them from whatever opioid they're using to buprenorphine in that one cell macrodosing swoop. Yeah, I think the timing is key. And in this case, um, there's, there's also some comments regarding um, naloxone and affinity comparison to buprenorphine um, that um, attendees have indicated that they um, are less concerned about the naloxone basically because of this affinity difference. I think in, the timing is, is so key. The other thing I'm concerned about is uh, what was unmasked here, if he's maybe using cocaine and synthetic cannabinoids and certainly getting him out of withdrawal is going to be very useful, but there may be some unmasked toxicity, not just severe precipitated withdrawal from the naloxone. So great comments. Any other um, thoughts, Dr. Lace? I think that the comment about what else has been unmasked is also really important, um, especially if he's been using intermittent benzodiazepines. You don't want to miss um, benzodiazepine withdrawal either. And if you... Right. There's... Go ahead, Rachel. Just a few clinical questions. I don't think that we got a respiratory rate or a SAT. So those would be important factors in my decision making and just what the patient's mental status is. Do I think that they can tolerate a sublingual film and not choke? First, do I have to go IV with the buprenorphine or just things to think about? Yeah, in this case, it depends on who's in the emergency department, what their familiarity is, how quickly do they call the experts? Because this gentleman was tachypnic, um, had some hypoxia, which was a concern. Um, and there's just a comment in our province by Dr. Vikas um, mentions that medics are not legally permitted to carry buprenorphine. They're working on that. And that's not a uniform policy. New York, we don't have um, medic available um, buprenorphine as well. I think that's just a pilot out of um, parts of New Jersey. It may be statewide, but um, let's move to the next slide. Uh, this is a slide from Dr. Logan about synthetic cannabinoid a very, uh, trends in the United States. Dr. Logan, you want to comment on current synthetic cannabinoid trends and combinations? Yeah, what, on the uh, prior slide, the subject had indicated potential prior K2 use. So um, again, this is a trend report from the first quarter of 2021. Quite a lot of turnover still in terms of the actual compounds, but um, and the, the trend is towards them having uh, the, the more recent compounds having higher uh, receptor affinity, at least than uh, some of their predecessors. So there's definitely some effort being made on the part of the designers uh, to make them more potent. Um, I had a lot of questions about, uh, since they're often found uh, in toxicology in combination with opioids, whether these are combination products. And in our experience, they seem not to be users appear to be using, uh, uh, mixing uh, K2 use with opioid and other drug use. 
Uh, most commonly, the synthetic cannabinoids are found present with other uh, drugs. We had a, a series of cases in Philadelphia a few years ago now um, where uh, there was a product that contained a mixture of a synthetic cannabinoid and fentanyl, a little bit of heroin. Uh, a, a large number of people ended up in the ER. Uh, they all got uh, naloxone um, and had an uncharacteristic emergence from that because it was an unmasking of the, uh, of the synthetic cannabinoid uh, uh, effect uh, profile. Uh, the looped kind of anticholinergic, uh, so uh, there was some thought initially that maybe that was, uh, they were taking uh, an anticholinergic, uh, but the agitation, disorientation, confusion um, uh, is something that you do see with synthetic cannabinoids. So Thank again, uh, this, is, uh, this is the last of these uh, slides, but we do update uh, this information on a quarterly basis, just tracking what new drugs are entering the uh, the, the U.S. markets uh, and which ones are, are starting they're they're starting to replace. Thank you. Anecdotally, had patients describe awareness of illicit uh, synthetic cannabinoids sold usually as a, a joint or um, you know with they felt uh, fentanyl added or they were told that they had fentanyl added um, compared to if they still buy it in the bodegas where it is available in Rochester and some of the areas um, that, that it doesn't have fentanyl. So then we've had a couple of cases where patients have come in with intoxication positive for fentanyl and they report using nothing but cake, synthetic cannabinoid. Let's move to the next slide. Hey, can I make one quick comment? Um, yes. Let me, let me let you go first and I'll, I'll see if it maybe you'll cover what I was going to say. No, no I, didn't, I was just going to comment. This is a, a slide um, and, you know, after the awareness of some patients um, commenting on fentanyl adulteration of the synthetic cannabinoid supply on the street, but um, that's anecdotal. And um, this is just some data uh, or a, a announcement. Um, paramedics empowered to administer addiction treatment to patients in the field, and the data was presented at ACM 2021 by Dr. Rachel Harrell's um, EMS administered buprenorphine. Go ahead, Dr. Nelson. Yeah. So, I mean, I wasn't going to say this, but I'll say it anyway. So, so Rachel Rose is down in Southern New Jersey, near Philadelphia. I'm in Northern New Jersey in New York city. Um, I think to Ingrid's point um, and yours uh, only, only at Cooper are they able to give you buprenorphine. We're trying to get that program up here in Newark now. Um, so technically it's not, it, it's legal in the whole state, but it's a whole system you have to put in place uh, to get that done, which includes being able to refer these patients to, uh, some sort of outpatient treatment, because remember, that's part of administering buprenorphine is getting them some sort of connection post care. Um, what I was going to actually say, and I think it's, it's a little unrelated, but I think it's important is that we tend to overdose people with naloxone to begin with. And this person should never have gotten three, four milligram doses of intranasal naloxone. Right. And it, this is what happens when you do that. You know, you set yourself up for, for complications. And I, I understand why people do it. People think naloxone intranasally is going to just wake the person up and they're going to be all better. But especially given, you know, co-intoxicants and the risk of hypoxic encephalopathy from the opioid and, and the rate at which naloxone intranasally reverses an overdose, people tend to overdose people with naloxone. We wind up taking care of a lot of people with severe precipitate withdrawal that don't have to happen. Remember the, the end point of naloxone is just to have people breathe. It's not to have them in withdrawal. It's not to have them run away from the scene. It's not to have them vomiting. Uh, it's not even to have them awake. All you want them to do is breathe. So in almost everybody, and literally almost everybody, four milligrams intranasal is more than enough. A lot of systems are, are looking at this new eight milligram product, thinking it's gonna work faster and better, but it's not. And um, I think it's gonna to lead to a lot more precipitate withdrawal and a lot more complications. And when people withdraw and leave the scene and go and use more drug, that almost never leads to a good outcome, right? Because it's very difficult to overcome the effects of the naloxone with, with standard opioid. And, and all the opioids we use last a lot longer than the naloxone does. So I think a key, right. key issue is not to overdose. You know, nobody's dying. Very few people are dying of that opioid overdose, particularly after the four milligrams, right? Very few people who overdose on opioids die. A lot do in absolute numbers, but per, from a percentage wise, it's actually a pretty small number. Right. 
your points are well said. I agree. I see a lot of complications from high dose naloxone, pulmonary edema, aspiration of menitis, uh, the per severe precipitated withdrawal in somebody that is vulnerable, has cardiac disease, has older comorbidities. Um, yeah, you understand why people panic and give doses pre-hospital, but in the hospital, we can be much more nuanced. And I don't think, you know, I think I'm concerned about an eight milligram dose being available. All right, let's move to the next slide. The patient is given a dose of imidazolam by EMS during transport and is intubated in the critical care bay as he had signs of aspiration, cough, rowels, ronchi, right side, persistent diffuse tremors and hyperflexia, in particular in the lower extremities. He's sedated with propofol and initially fentanyl, but this has changed to hydromorphone based on the possibility that this was serotonergic toxicity that was unmasked with the naloxone per phone conversation. Um, the toxicology or addiction specialist was not immediately available in the ED, um, so the ED physician decided this. And a buprenorphine microinduction is performed while he is intubated and treated for aspiration pneumonia. The urine returns with fentanyl, cocaine, methamphetamine, amphetamine, THC, benzodiazepines, and his significant other reported that he's also been smoking one to two blunts a day of synthetic cannabinoid and using two to four milligrams of prazolam again, as well as the one to two bundles a day of heroin and fentanyl. Next slide. So we've already talked about what types of synthetic cannabinoids are currently most available. Um, and we've in the past have talked about the prestalprazolam. We can comment a little bit about that. Um, and you know, other comments or questions, we Dr. Nelson brought up his concerns about the eight milligram naloxone formulation. So in order to get to the next case, does that, do any other other panelists have any other comments regarding this? Maybe I briefly have, what about yeah, I have one question, Tim, for, for, for Barry Logan. Um, what about what are we seeing now in terms of the design of benzodiazepines? And are they are we seeing a lot? And are they mixed with our with our fentanyl supply? Uh, yeah. So the pressed uh, pills, typically Xanax bars, are the most uh, popular, uh, probably because of the most recognizable uh, formulation. Um, but they are rarely alprazolam. Um, they are uh, frequently atizolam. That's the number one uh, synthetic uh, uh, or designer benzodiazepine. Uh, we had uh, a big surge of fluoroprazolam cases at the end of last year, although fluoroprazolam uh, is now in decline. And then another designer, uh, clonazolam, um, is now in the ascendancy. So the drugs do change. You have to have uh, pretty good awareness if you want to, to confirm it analytically of what is in the markets. Um, but yes, the, a very large percentage of individual doses now is moving towards pressed uh, pills and away from uh, bindles or glycine bags. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I just want to comment. Um, there's also a complication that if a patient has not been ventilating for a period of time, um, more naloxone is not going to reverse the hypercapnia or hypercarbia and the narcosis ventilation will, but the naloxone in and of itself won't. I've had that um, occur a number of times. The naloxone isn't working because our PCO2 is well above 100, or there's other drugs there, variety of reasons. Let's move on to the next slide. And we'll, we have a, a brief case. This is a 42-year-old male who runs out of his source for methadone. He was buying 120 milligrams a day from a friend who disappeared. He decides to try buprenorphine. He takes a piece of an eight milligram film or eight such two, about a half, but 18 hours after his last use of the 120 milligrams of methadone, he feels mostly restless and myalgic. He notices his heart rate is up, but he's not having more severe symptoms. He calls his outpatient clinic provider where he'd been getting treatment, but not getting medications for opioid use disorder. Um, it's um, not an opioid treatment program. And this is about an hour after the onset of symptoms and he's asking for help. Next slide. So how would you advise this patient now with mild precipitated withdrawal about 18 hours after 120 milligrams of methadone? He is not enrolled in an opioid treatment program. What are the different options for him to do? And you've got him via phone at first, and he's at home. Um, Dr. Whiteman. So I, I think the first question is, does this patient want to be on methadone, or does he want to be transitioned to buprenorphine? Because I'm going to probably go a different pathway based on the patient's wishes um, for that. If they want to be transitioned, to buprenorphine, they've already taken a four milligram dose, which is significant and are already in precipitated withdrawal. And if they want to be on bup, I would continue their bup and probably give them 16 milligrams of bup right then. Um, 
for an ideal situation if he hadn't already taken the bup and I was trying to transition someone from methadone to bup in a smoother fashion without precipitated withdrawal. There are some case reports out there and some protocols where pe people do micro inductions. So when patients are on their methadone dose, you start with a patch and you kind of build them up over time. Um, other treatment strategies are decreasing their methadone dose over time, but I think that takes a really long time and it's not necessarily tolerated that well by patients to bring them down to 30 or 40 milligrams of methadone. Um, I think more traditional protocols keep them on that regimen for like a week or so and then stop the dose and then sometimes even cause them or require them to go into precipitated withdrawal before starting buprenorphine. So I think the micro induction is, an, is a nice option for doing the methadone to bup transition in a smooth, smoother fashion. All right, good. You bring up some great points. Dr. Lace, what about, what are you, your thoughts? So given that it's mild precipitated withdrawal, I would usually go with the microdosing in this case, if he wanted to stay on the buprenorphine. And for that, I've um, had some difficulty on the inpatient side, getting them to go down to 0.5 milligrams of buprenorphine. And so I've been using one milligram of a combination product, and that has been um, adequate for patients. Um, and then I just increase it over the next few days. It's a little difficult with this being a telephone call to um, uh, arrange this, but it is possible. Thank you. Dr. Bashevitz, do you have thoughts? Um, so, so this makes one think of, uh, does he want methadone maintenance? What would he do better on that? Uh, if the answer to that question is yes, uh, one of the problems with this is if a methadone uh, program takes him, people should know that most methadone programs would just simply start him on whatever the normal starting dose is, which is 30 or 40 milligrams in most uh, states. Um, be, for uh, for reasons that you can't prove that he's been on 120 milligrams of methadone <laughs> by himself. So um, he would not be satisfied with that amount of methadone and might be using other substances, but might be preferable to him uh, than um, uh, getting on to uh, buprenorphine. Thank you. All right, let's move to the next slide. We've got a few minutes. Provider discusses the use of adjunctive meds, trying to microinduction with some telemedicine visits and video, and in order to instruct how to take a small dose. Um, the thought was that this was, uh, there's still a lot of methadone there potentially. Um, maybe he didn't take the four very well, um, wasn't clear. And so um, we wanted to start low and titrate up until he's feeling better. And generally I'll start low if the patient tolerates these two doses. I have the protocol on the next page close together, then I'll escalate to a higher dose and use clonidine as an adjunct to medication. Um, we also discussed referral to a, the emergency department to get a dose of methadone and, and to see how he was feeling there or just in general an evaluation, in particular if he had chest pain or worsening symptoms. And we've already talked about how there are differences from planning a transition. Um, next slide from 120 milligrams of methadone, Dr. Whiteman brought that up. So there's a couple of different options. There's the, the czar method, um, which is published, which uses uh, methadone um, titration down and small doses of buprenorphine with a transdermal fentanyl um, patch applied um, as a bridge. Uh, there's case reports that published. And again, this, the regulations on how to do this are, or what, whether one could use you know, the full agonist fentanyl in an outpatient setting for this um, method, it would vary by country. This it was published from Canada, I believe. Um, otherwise, 24 to 28 hours after the last methadone dose, start small dose of buprenorphine, one milligram, for example, with slow titration up as Dr. Lace. And the microdosing that I discussed was 250 micrograms times two an hour apart, and with a lot of hand holding and checking in, and then a half milligram times two, and then a milligram times two. And the patient really starts to feel better, more rapid escalation of this can occur. And you really need to get to the end to get that eight milligram dose or two of them and three of them even maybe that first day so the patient feels better. Um, otherwise, if methadone is still available 24 hours after the 120 milligrams, um, dropping to 30 and then waiting another 24 hours later to do a standard induction, the patient feels a little bit rough with that. 
And then the classic tapers in the outpatient opiate treatment program are slowly tapering down by you know, number of milligrams every other day or every third day before getting to 30 or 40 milligrams. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just a, a publication I wanted to, to show. There was a small number of patients that had um, been maintained on 100 milligrams of methadone, and the, the authors studied the transition to buprenorphine very varying doses from low dose to high dose, and as well as a split dose um, 24 hours after receiving the 100 milligram dose, and showed a lot of variability. Uh, 10 completed the study. This is a randomized uh, crossover study. Um, Three patients actually tolerated very high dose buprenorphine inductions, um, and seven of the 10 uh, much, much better tolerated split dosing buprenorphine. But again, the, the, there's a lot of variability by patient in this study. And um, if you're interested in looking at some of the um, responses to the buprenorphine 24 hours after the methadone, I encourage you to take a look in more detail. Again, this is from Dr. Strain's lab and 16 uh, patients. This doesn't do it justice. There's some nuances that Dr. Nelson and I have discussed. Um, next slide. Um, but there's an increasing number of publications that are describing microinductions. Um, just a quick search um, led to about 20 publications, it seemed. Um, I just did a screenshot of a couple of case reports and a case series. Um, and um, so that's an increasingly common practice. Next slide. Um, we have our final thought, but I, we're right at the, the one hour. Does anyone have any closing thoughts or comments um, before I get to our final thought, which is from Charles Bukowski? So if no final thoughts or comments. These slides are available or will be available both through the ASAM website as well as ACMT, and please complete your evaluations. This is uh, Raw with Love by Charles Bukowski, who was sometimes called the Poet Laureate to Skid Row. Raw with love. I will remember the kisses, our lips raw with love, and how you gave me everything you had, and how I offered you what was left of me. And I will remember your small room, the feel of you, the light in the window, your records, your books, our morning coffee, our noons, our nights, our bodies spilled together, sleeping, the tiny flowing currents, immediate and forever, your leg, my leg, your arm, my arm, your smile, and the warmth of you who made me laugh again. And with that, everyone have a great weekend, and we will be back in July for the uh, first Friday in July, which is the second. And uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you all, panelists. It was a great discussion. Thanks, Tim, and, and everybody else.